of what the Chinese thought or saw of these people living in what we'll call Central Asia and further the Iranian plateau uh, on Sogdians and uh, the Parthians. These are two people who speak an Iranian language. Uh, if I, I'm sorry if I would bore you, but I would like to just read it to make a point. Uh, the Anshi, or the Parthia, is situated several thousands li, it's a measure of distance, west of the region of the great Yerji. The people are settled on the land, cultivating the fields and growing rice and wheat. So it's an area that is very much into cultivation. They also make wine out of grapes, so they're more wine producers. They have walled cities like the people of Dayuan. Now, this is either Sogdiana or Bactria. There is a uh, debate over this, but I will take it as Sogdiana. The region containing several hundreds of cities of various sizes. Some of the inhabitants are merchants who travel by carts or boats to the neighboring countries. The coins of the country are made of silver and bear the face of the king. Well, um, he seems to be at least accurate in some of the evidence that we have. So there's interest because they're commodities, because they're traders. And so contact would be nice, and perhaps Chinese goods can also travel westward and other things coming eastward. And so that may be a reason why uh, Wudi, Emperor Wudi, uh, makes this contact with King Mithridates. A nice general picture of a first century AD, uh, very organized, nicely organized. Things weren't that organized in antiquity, but at least we look at empires. And in antiquity, they have much of a less, I think, of a negative connotation. But we can see that uh, the Parthian Empire, the Arsaces are right here, the Kushans, China, Han, and here's our Silk Route, and the Roman world. So you may imagine of a, a four empire uh, next to each other, and there's going to be some trade going on and with trade contacts is also going to be taking place. Here is the route that we think uh, took commodities uh, all the way from uh, China to Kashgar. Here's Dunhuang, uh, the Urumqi area, uh, all the way through uh, Central Asia, Iranian Plateau, Mesopotamia, the Levant, and perhaps going up. For about a thousand years, we have suggestions and evidence of this contact. And what is being uh, traded? Again, I'm being somewhat general in this idea of trade, uh, is silk and spice. After all, it was called silk rope, and that is because what the Chinese are able to produce. Spice, mainly coming from India, and in antiquity, it's not for tasting good, uh, it's for food preservation, it's for medicine, it's things that save your life and keeps your food, rather than just uh, making food taste good. Okay, so in that way, spice becomes very important uh, as a commodity to be, of course, that is extracted here. It is sent uh, westward and, of course, eastward. And silk. Uh, what is being bought, of course, or given in uh, return for silk and spice is sometimes uh, monetary exchange, the silver coins that we saw. And the Chinese apparently were interested in these silver coins. And also there's a barter economy, of course, going on in antiquity. It depends on where you are and which empire or kingdom uh, you are at. Here is a more uh, complicated idea of trade, of what things may be going eastward and westward. So who wants to sell? Well, we find that Chinese silk has this special quality. It's because uh, uh, the mulberry leaves that uh, is being fed to the, to the worms, the way the Chinese are able to graft uh, the silk makes it very special, much more desired than anybody else who can make silk. It's not that others weren't making silk. The Persians uh, in the fifth century are making silk. They have silk factories, but it's nowhere near what the Chinese are making. And it's that Chinese silk that uh, fetches the highest price, and people want it. And so we can imagine that uh, silk is going slowly this way, westward, while money, that is gold and silver, is moving eastward. So there is a movement of, generally speaking, commodities westward and money going eastward. That is what we can imagine for the first uh, thousand years of common era. Who are taking these things east and west are a number of people. Uh, these are businessmen who make a lot of money for what empires desire. Uh, the Armenians, uh, the Bactrians, the Persians, the Sogdians, the Chinese themselves, as well as the Arabs, 
are very interested to make a lot of money, and indeed they did from uh, the documentation that we have as early as the 8th century or even before that. Uh, the immense wealth that is made by these people who are trading, it's a lucrative job. And that is why this road is so alive. Uh, just to look at all the way to the west end of this empire, uh, what we have is, of course, an empire um, uh, that is doing quite well by the first century of BC or in the first century AD. It's turned into an empire that is Rome. Uh, it's an empire that desires luxury. And so the Romans certainly desired, as, a, as well as uh, the Persians and others who can afford it. Uh, this brings us further to the issue of Africa, where you get your gold is Africa. And the Romans did this through another trade system, uh, bypassing, of course, the Saharan Desert with the Berbers, going and extracting gold and bringing it back on. So we already have this economy taking place from Africa and Europe and being connected to Asia. Things are connected already. Now, on the Silk Road, not only commodities are being traded and exchanged, but also religious ideas. On this road, you would find Zoroastrians, Buddhists, Christians, Mandaeans, Manichaeans, Muslims. Now, most of these people are actually quite um, mobile. Uh, I would hold off to, on the Mandaeans, and we'll talk about them. We'll go from the east and look at them when we're coming to the west. Uh, the Zoroastrians, the Buddhists, and the Christians, and the Manic, and the Muslims did trade and actually moved around. As we look at people in each region, we'll see that Mandaeans, for specific reasons, are attached to Mesopotamia and where they are. By the way, here is a Sogdian uh, manuscript that survives from the Silk Road. Uh, so you see a typical Sogdian text very nicely ornate, at least it was when it was in one piece, uh, with a musical scene and a Sogdian text, if I'm not mistaken. My friend Johan de Weina, who is a professor of Iranian at Stanford now, would be able to catch my mistakes. But I think that's Sogdian, and that is uh, what survives from this Turfan area. Uh, let's talk about Christianity first. Christianity, of course, when we think about it today, where do we think of Christianity? No. Usually, let's say, Rome or perhaps the West. But of course, it is clear that uh, Christianity early on also had roots in uh, Asia. Uh, that should not be a surprise for you. Uh, here's a Nestorian church in Baghdad. And there are still Christians in Baghdad and the Near East. They just happen to have been much more in the first centuries of common era. Uh, and they were mobile. They moved around. And of course, they converted people as well. One of these uh, Christians, these Christian groups that are quite interesting, uh, are the Nestorian Christians. Uh, which also became the official church uh, in Sasanian Iran in late antiquity, in the 5th century, when uh, a Sasanian king recognizes the importance of Christianity. There is no way uh, to go about it. Christianity is spreading. Rather than having difficulties and uh, persecution, it is much better to co-opt them. So why don't we create a Persian uh, Christian church, have it I have the Catholicos, the head of the church, at the capital, where he's close to the uh, emperor or the king, who can somehow offset what is happening in Rome with its Christianity. So now there are these loyalties uh, being uh, taking side between Christians of the Iranian world and the Christians of the Roman world. And sometimes that coming into question, of course, when there is war. But these Christians didn't stay in Iran. They traveled further east and east. And in fact, uh, by the 7th century, 653, we have a bilingual Syriac, the language that is native to these historians, uh, and Chinese inscription naming 70 of the Nestorian missionaries uh, that were in China. So already in the 7th century, Christianity established a foothold in China. Okay? 